Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10, actually 12 in this case, stunning albums of non-standard repertoire on a super cool independent label. And the label in question is Suprafon, the national label of what used to be Czechoslovakia and is now Czechia. And oh my, what a great label this is. A lot of smaller countries, particularly particularly in Eastern Europe, had national record labels. There was Hungariton in Hungary. There's Melodia in Russia. This was partly a result of the communist regime. Um, Russia, of course, not being a smaller country, but being a communist country. Some of the others being both communist and small. And so it made sense for the state to sponsor a record label that would feature their artists and their major composers. And the, the case of the Czech Republic is a particularly interesting one because the Czech Republic has a whole slew of composers for a tiny little country. It's one of the most musical places on earth and has tons of musicians, tons of really fine composers. And, and some of those composers are international composers. We know them all well, of course. Dvorak, Martinu, Janicek, Smetana, and, and just tons of composers from the classical period when none of these countries were countries. They were all part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, and so everything was kind of jumbled up. And so we have lots and lots of composers. They also have composers who they've adopted or who were both Czech composers and international composers, but from a different ethnicity. People like Mahler, who were the German Jewish ethnic minority in Bohemia. And so they, he is both Czech and he's Jewish and he's German. And he claimed he was rejected by everybody. And, you know, it's rather fascinating. So, so Superfon, as a label, recorded all of these things. And from my perspective, we all know how marvelous a lot of the Czech artists were. We all know how wonderful the Czech composers were. They've been recorded by everybody. But I want to focus on things that they did that other people didn't or couldn't or have only lately started doing um, after decades and decades because, because the, the beauty of a label like Superfun is that, is that it was able to dig into familiar composers in depth in a way that that you know the rest of us said didn't know things existed and at the same time to to you know focus on composers we'd never heard of and unearth a lot of terrific music so i have not 10 which is what i started with and what most of these talks so far have done but 12 and of course we could do dozens of really really interesting recordings and i have them all sitting here and we're going to take them one at a time and go through them. And as usual, the list is right below here so that you can see what the composers and works are. First, Zelenka, the great Czech Baroque composer who actually spent most of his career in Dresden. But he wrote this thing, the closest he ever got to an opera. And it's called, it says a little crack in its jewel case here. It's called Sub Olea Pacis et Palma Virtutis Conspicua Orbi Regia Bohemiae Corona. Isn't that an evocative and lovely title? What it means is, under the olive tree of peace and the palm tree of virtue, the crown of Bohemia splendidly shines before the whole world. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this was composed in 1723. It is one of those ceremonial opera things. It's not really an opera. It's not really an oratorio. It's kind of an oratorio. It's a melodrama, the Sancto Venceslao, according to this, Venceslao, which is a story. I mean, it's, it's, it's dramatic in the sense that it tells a story, but the story is always one of, you know, religious virtue and, and you, you know, uh, something that justifies the, the tyrannical reign of whatever ruler is being crowned, which is like what this was for. It doesn't make any difference. We listen to these things because the music is glorious, and Zelenka's music is glorious and personal and weird and quirky and marvelous. And this is like the only recording I think of. This may have been another one since then. I don't remember exactly. Um, I can look over here in the overflow room and see if there's something else sitting around in there. But the point is that Zelenka's music is so personal and so interesting and so much fun to listen to that he could be he could be singing about the Prague Telephone Directory and it would be worth 
doing. And this is a beautiful performance. You know, it features Musica Floria under Marek Stern, Strind, Strind, that's the guy's name. And oh my goodness, it's just endless fun. It really is, believe it or not. Something as dreary as a royal coronation, plotless um, morality melodrama could be so much fun. You're not going to believe how much fun it is because Alenka's music is all like that. And super fun was just the people, the group to do it. They also published it, by the way, because I have the score. And in addition to making records, there was a publishing wing of super fun, and they published a lot of this music, a lot of Zelenka's music. So there you go. That's number one. Zelenka's, Zelenka's, whatever the heck it is, just call it sub olea pachis. That's the the easiest way to remember it. And it is it is marvelous. And there's that. Next, we're going to take this stuff sort of in very rough chronological order. That's the best way to do it. Anton Reicha. Now, Reicha, we've talked about quite a bit because he was another incredibly fascinating and exploratory composer, you know, a teacher of Berlioz and other folk like that. He actually spent most of his career at the Paris Conservatory, writing treatises and composing things that completely puzzled his contemporaries. This is a bit more normal. Reich's years were 1770 to 1836. So he was he was a contemporary of Beethoven. He was friends with Beethoven. Beethoven was just as puzzled as everybody else by some of his music. And these are his piano trios. Three absolutely fascinating, lovely, enjoyable, bubbly and marvelous piano trios. Of course, the D minor isn't exactly bubbly. It's in the minor key. But these are wonderful, wonderful pieces. And no one talks about them or plays them. And the Guarneri, Guarneri Trio Prague has done them. And one of you mentioned this very, very recently in one of the comments. And I was so happy you did because I had been planning on talking about this disc. One of the wonderful things that Superfauna was able to do was a lot of chamber music. A tremendous amount of chamber music, unknown chamber music. And, uh, you know, that's one of the glories of their catalog, because, of course, the Czech tradition of, for example, string quartet playing and chamber ensemble playing is, is one of the, the, you know, pearls of Western civilization. It really is. And so this disc is fabulous. And if you're interested in Reicha, as you should be, because I've been talking about him quite a bit, um, then you really ought to hear these works. They're, they're beautiful gems of the classical period. They really are. And full of interesting ideas and design. So the Reicha piano trios are on super fun and they're delightful. Now we have to talk about one of the other things that they did. The opposite end of chamber music is opera, big vocal pieces, choral works, things that are really expensive, things that are never going to get played because of language barriers, because of the need to learn things in Czech, for example. That's changed, by the way. It's changed because of Superfun and because of, you know, the, the advocacy of conductors like Charles McCarris or people who started doing Czech music in Czech, and particularly the operas of Janáček, I mean, more than anybody. But Czech opera is a world, a world of fabulous pieces that most people don't know at all. But Superfond recorded them. Thank God. And of course, the God of, I said, thank God, and the God, God, the deity, let's put it that way, of Czech com operatic composers is Smetna. And we all know The Bartered Bride, which sometimes gets done in German as the Verkaufte Braut, and sometimes in English as the Bartered Bride or whatever it is. And that's the opera, the Czech National Opera. So that's the one everybody does. But Smetna actually provided um, his homeland with an entire repertoire of opera, from tragedy to ceremonial works to comedies, everything. It's all there. He did it all, and he did it all extremely well. And so I have a representative example. The Two Widows. When was the last time you listened to The Two Widows? Now, this opera went through certain revisions. It was written originally as a, a Zingspiel kind of piece. That is an opera, an opera comique, an opera with dialogue. It's based on a French play, a French story, not, you know, one of those things with happy Czech peasants running around and, you know. And it has, it has um, a rather sophisticated and lovely little witty plot. It's a conversation piece more than anything else. It's about, not surprisingly, two widows 
um, they are sisters. And the glum, recently widowed sister will not look at the guy who's in love with her. And so her other sister, who is wealthy and lives in a castle and whatnot, um, engineers things so that she and the guy who is in love with her can finally get together and be happy. And then, of course, there's the, the subsidiary couple, the servant couple that also wants to get married and the grumpy father. And, you know, all of that stuff is in here. Um, and the plot doesn't much matter so much, but the music is delicious. It's light and witty and effervescent and, and almost French in its finesse and in its verve. It's just marvelous. By the way, did you know the Czech, the Czech word here for widow is, is, is vdovi. Um, you know, it's, it's dvě vdovi. And vdovi is the same word in English as widow. I mean, just think of vidov, vdovi, get it? It's somehow they're all related. I think that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, the Slavic word for widow and they, well, never mind. The point is to listen to the music. It's absolutely great. And there's a whole pile of Smetna operas. There's The Kiss. There's there's The Devil's Wall. There's The Secret. There's Dolly Boar. There's, there's, there's Libusha. I mean, really an amazing, an amazing selection of things. So The Two Widows is one example. Another example, which you really ought to hear, is this fabulous one-act opera, The Stubborn Lovers. Now, The Stubborn Lovers by Dvorak. Dvorak. Who knew Dvorak wrote, all, oh, Dvorak wrote a whole pile of operas? I think he wrote more than Smetna. And a surprising number of them are really excellent, but they're only played in, in Czechia. You don't hear them anywhere else. This one actor would be a perfect one-act thing with some other one-act comedy, like, you know, like 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 Les Mamelles de Tiresias by Poulenc or something like that. One of those lovely one-act comedies, not with like Bluebeard's Castle. The plot, by the way, is basically the same as the musical The Fantastics. Or you might say that The Fantastics is the same plot as The Stubborn Lovers. You know, it's about two kids who who basically their 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 parents want them to get married. But because their parents want them to get married, they'll do just the opposite. So in order to convince them or trick them into admitting the fact that they really love each other and they should get married, the parents pretend that they want to marry the other one. That is, the father wants to marry the girl and the mother wants to marry the boy or the father. It's, it's that kind of, you know, it's silly. It's just a silly situation comedy. And it's, it's in one act. It has a fabulous overture. It's like a 10-minute long, big, beefy, meaty Dvorak overture, which never gets played and deserves to. It's as marvelous a piece of orchestral music as Dvorak wrote. And it's, it, oh, and this is a wonderful performance, by the way, with a terrific cast under Yerzy Bielohlavek of, you know, native singers. Um, there's a review of it on classicstoday.com. If you want to go read that, Bob Levine reviewed it and enjoyed it very much. This should be standard Rep. It's that simple, but you'll only hear it here on Superfun. Now, one of the reasons it was sort of, um, let's just say, incognito for all these years is because the original translation of the plot of the title was not The Stubborn Lovers. It was The Pig-Headed Peasants. That's not going to sell. Here's a news flash. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's going to buy an opera called The Pig-Headed Peasants, but The Stubborn Lovers is a much smarter translation of the title. And so that probably got the product, uh, you know, at least at least a little bit more, um, a little bit more chance of success. But it's, it's just a great work. And there you go. It's super fun. So... Next, well, composers who we didn't know until Superfund started recording them. Yosef Suk. Now, everybody knows the Azrael Symphony. People are starting to know the Summer Tale, the successor to the Azrael Symphony. The Azrael Symphony is on here, but you also get the other two tone poems after the Summer Tale. You get Ripening and Epilogue, which are, you know, here beautifully played by Václav Neumann with the Czech Philharmonic along with a dynamite Azrael. Now, these were later stuck in a box with the Libor Peshek Summer Tale, and this stuff is glory, glorious. I mean, these are big, juicy, Richard Strauss-like, sophisticated, symphonic poem-type pieces. 
and and they're starting to become rather more popular because Peshek had the the what was it the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic and he recorded a lot of these things for Virgin at that time and and also also Shandos did some with Bielochlavek so so yeah you know these Czech conductors made the rounds and they you know when the classical independent labels were looking for new repertoire Sook was a logical person to exploit but Superfund got got the ball going with these marvelous performances and very good digital sound with the Czech Philharmonic, which is incomparable. So there you go. Sook, epilogue, ripening, and all that other stuff. Um, next, well, Superfun also was able to do a lot of repertoire by better known composers, but less familiar works by those composers. And one of those wonderful discs is this one, Ernest Bloch. This is an absolutely terrific performance of Shalomo, which is his most popular work, of course, with Andre Navarra and Carl Anschurl conducting What's Not to Love. But you also get the violin concerto on this disc with, with Hyman Bress, violin in the Prague Symphony under Yindrich, 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 Yindrich Rohan. That's his name, whatever it is. And the Suite Ibraik for violin and orchestra, making this an absolutely marvelous block disc. It was recorded in 1964 and 1966, and there were years, I mean years, that went by where the block violin concerto was almost impossible to find. I mean, there was like an old scratchy 78 with, with like, with um, who, who was it, Joseph Segetti and Mengelberg or someone like that. I mean, you just, nobody recorded it, and the block violin concerto was glorious. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful work. So, yeah! Another marvelous disc, and it's, again, just interesting repertoire. I mean, this is the kind of thing an indie label that was not necessarily a Czech national label would do. But Superphone actually did quite a few of these things of interesting composers. They also did Roussel's Evocations. They did a lot of very good French music, too, that other people weren't doing. Dandy, they did all kinds of cool stuff. So that's, you know, depending on who the conductors were that were able to visit and and, and do programs. So there they were... They were quite adventurous in their day. And there you go. Next. Oh, God, I love this disc. I really love this disc. This is not available now. I don't see it available now anyway, but I do hope you can find it because I've been raving about this work forever. Novak, Vyacheslav Novak, who's a wonderful composer that deserves a lot more attention. And Superfund should really, you know, release a box or do some edition. And, you know, it's not that there's so much of it. And, and the work is Nicotina. It's a comic ballet pantomime about a snuff-addicted monk who, who hallucinates about this voluptuous um, young, young nubile female, female embodiment of his nicotine addiction. And the music is just marvelous. I mean, it should be as popular as Daphnis and Chloe. It has a wordless choir. Um, boy, is it great. And in this performance, you get Nicotina with Toman and the Wood Nymph. Um, with the Brno State Philharmonic under Frantisek Zilek, the Janicek specialist. This is a great disc. And there's actually a, a sequel to Nicotina, a much more serious and dark piece called Signorina Gioventu, which um, you can also get. They came out as a pair, and I just, it should never be out of print. It's such a glorious piece of music. It really is. So keep your, keep your eye on it. Keep your eye out for it. See if you can find it. And, you know, if other people are out there do more Novak. Record this stuff. There are some people doing Novak now, actually. So, uh, I mean, you know, Joanne Follett has done some for Naxos, and Chandos had some, and it would be really great to see it. Another composer who you may not know is Josef Bohuslav Forster. Now, his fourth symphony is somewhat known because Raphael Kublik did an old 1930s or 40s recording of his fourth symphony, the Easter Easter Eve Symphony, and it's been since recorded in stereo and whatnot. He was, he lived forever, Forster. I don't have his dates here, but he lived to be like 99 or 150 or I, so let me see if his dates are in the booklet here. Okay, where are we? Yeah, Forster, 1859 to 1951. Yeah, I mean, he lived to be really old. He was quite friendly with Mahler. I mean, you know, we have some 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 stories of like what Mahler was up to from Forster because they used to hang out together. And this lovely disc contains two of his his big later non-symphonic works, which I actually think he was sort of better at. Cyrano de Bergerac, which is also available later recorded on Orfeo. There are other recordings of that. And his Shakespeare Suite, 
Opus 76. The music is kind of Richard Straussy romantic, um, with maybe a few Czech spicy flavorings added some sprinkles or something like that. But it's wonderful. And these performances are with Václav Smetacek, with the Czech Phil and the Prague Symphony Orchestra. And Forster also wrote some beautiful piano music and some lovely, lovely chamber works. He's a, he's a good, solid, what you might call second tier composer. If you want to, if you want to start ranking, which I never really like, because you should take these things one, one, step at a time, one work at a time, but Forster is definitely somebody to consider. And there he is. And then, let's see, what are we, how many of these are there? Two, three, four, five, oh, we're doing very well. Well, as I said, the Czechs are one of the countries that claim Mahler as their own, and rightly so. And they have a marvelous tradition of Mahler playing and Mahler performance. And the Czech Philharmonic is one of the great Mahler orchestras. And there are few performances of Mahler more powerful and moving than this one. This is that famous Mahler Ninth Symphony conducted by Carl Anschel, which is simply gut-wrenching. Absolutely phenomenal with those snarling Czech winds in the Rondo Burlesque. And the you know, finale, which is urgent. It's not a slow, trudgy version of the final adagio, but rather an incredibly singing, lyrical, passionate, and hair-raising, hair-raising performance. Glorious, absolutely glorious, 78 minutes and 53 seconds of pure Mahlerian gold, and it's in the Antro Gold series. I've talked about it before, I've reviewed it before, many of you have commented on it, but I would be remiss if I did not discuss the magnificent superphone tradition of Mahler performance. So there that is. And then, oh, returning to chamber music, we're at number, like, I don't know, 10 now. Yes, this is number 10. This is a wonderful, wonderful performance. I mean, we've talked about Anne Sherl and Neumann, and there, I mean, there's so many fabulous Czech artists. You know, I don't have any string quartets here, and I should. I really should. I have to apologize for that in advance. So if it has, you know, the Pinocchio Quartet, the Janicek Quartet, you know, the Schampa Quartet, just Pavel Haas Quartet, get them all. The Smetna Quartet, they're amazing. They're just amazing. And they're also all in super fun. But this is a wonderful disc of, of um, violin sonatas. Janicek, Forster, and Vyacheslav Novak. Three composers we've already discussed, except for Janicek, and he's only represented by this work, his wonderful solitary violin sonata featuring Josef Suk, who is the grandson of, of the other Suk who wrote those things, ripening and whatever that stuff is, and Azrael, and he was the great-grandson of Dvorak, and the pianist is Jan Panenka, who is a fabulous you know, soloist and particularly chamber music accompanist. These are lovely, lovely works, and they embody that fabulous chamber music tradition that's that's so brilliantly captured on so many super fun recordings. So there, there you go. But we're going to wrap it up with two two things here. Um, first, another opera that you know really shocked everyone when it came out. I think it shocked me. Martinu, the Greek Passion. This is fascinating. First of all, because the original language, and it's recorded here in English. Martin who wrote it in English. And second of all, um, you know, this exists in a couple of versions, and the other version has been recorded, by the way. But this was one of the very first digital recordings of an opera. And while the major labels were missing, making a horrible mess of everything digital, this came out sounding fabulous. It's conducted by Charles McCarris, which of course means it's great. It has a great cast of John Mitchison and Mitchinson and Helen Field and John Tomlinson and you know, like famous people who really know how to sing. It's a great work. The story is about a shepherd, um, a Greek shepherd, who is asked to participate in a passion play, and in his real life begins to to take on the these these participants in this passion play begin to take on the actual roles um, of the the characters that they're playing. So there's there's. Ju you know, Jesus and Judas and Mary Magdalene and all of those things. It's really a wonderful kind of um, allegorical story, a beautiful allegor allegorical story set to marvelous, marvelous music. It was one of Martinu's very last works. It's in four acts and about two hours long, and it's marvelous. 
And I was just, when this came out, it just blew me away because it's like, who listened to Martin New Operas? And when was Superfund making digital recordings? I mean, you know, unlike, I have to say this, like Melodia, which is famous for making just awful quality recordings, the Czechs always made good recordings. They always did their best. They always were technically, you know, on on uh, on top of their game, and and uh, many of the recordings. I mean, everyone has good and bad, right? I mean, you know, and given the fact that it was a state-run communist enterprise, which was not based on a meritocracy, let's face it, they did awfully well. And this was this was just a, a stunner when it came out. So Martin News, the Greek passion. There's something different. Finally, last but certainly not least. Um, a composer who deserves to be much, much better known in a magnificent performance. Again, this features Carol Anschel, and it's it's Miroslav Kabalach. Kabalach. Yes, Kabalach, that's his name. Um, and Kabalach wrote this Passacaglia for orchestra, which I've talked about before, and so have some of you, called The Mystery of Time, a 23-minute long continuous movement, which is one of the great masterpieces of 20th century music. It is just one huge intense symphonic arch of sound that rises to an enormous climax and falls, and it is glorious. And this is an unbelievable performance. You also get his Hamlet improvisation for large orchestra and another work by Jan Hanusch, his symphony concertante for organ, harp, timpani, and strings, which is quite a different horse of another color, but he's an interesting composer too, Hanush. I don't think he's as good as Kabbalach, but wow, this is fun. This is really fun. And it just goes to show you, there's a whole bunch of Czech composers who only exist on Superphone, Superphone and who we only have samples of, individual works here and there, because they weren't systematic in exploiting them. But Kabbalach, they were. And there's a box of all the Kabbalach symphonies, which are also well worth hearing. He was a real creative guy. I mean, somebody with a, a, a marvelous imagination, a keen ear for sonority. His, his style was not, it was modernist. It wasn't a tonal modernist entirely, but it was free. It was his own. It's very, very serious, deeply thoughtful. He's a composer really worth getting to know. And Superfun has just about all of his stuff. And it's just, it's just tremendous. But The Mystery of Time is one of those works that if you don't know it, just download it and listen to it right now. Just put everything down, suck it up from whatever streaming service or thing you have, and just, just give it a listen. You will be floored. I guarantee it's just, it's just powerful beyond belief, unbelievably glorious. And that, my friends, is number 12. 12 fantastic works of musical art by that amazing, unbelievable Czech label, Superfun. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.